Okay, let's start. Um, do you have any questions to start with? There was one question whether you have to do both Google App Engine and Heroku for the assignment one. The answer is you pick one and you just do one. We only need one URL for the service which you deployed and it can be either uh, one of the two. So it's an exclusive or kind of choice. Um, if you really want to try both, you can try both, but you can only submit one URL. So we only will test one of your deployments. Um, which one to choose, Google or Heroku? Um, up to you. Uh, they pretty similar. They have very similar capa uh, capabilities. And the, you, the way you deploy is slightly different. So with Google, you're using kind of command line tools. And with uh, Heroku, you're using Git a little bit more. But they're kind of similar. Um, so no preference from our side. Uh, other questions? Yep. Right. So in the assignment, there should be specific if you need repository. repository yeah. Or... Yeah. So Chris will change that in the spec. We meaning repositories, not yeah. not projects. Yes, that's a good good catch. Okay. So how many of you started doing assignment one? Good. Uh, how many of you started programming something in Go? No. Yeah. All of you should have, but you know, if you haven't yet, then hopefully this week you will. Uh, so what we will do today, we will talk a little bit more about Go, a little bit more about uh, REST and web services, uh, and I would like you to try some things out. Um, so for starters, uh, if you can open your uh, Go environment. So how many of you are using Vim and how many of you are using ID? So who is using Vim to program in Go? And who is using um, ID? And wh which ID are you using? What do you use? Yep. And uh, yeah, you? Atom. Atom. Sublime. Sublime. So Sublime and Atoms are not really kind of full featured IDEs. They kind of more yeah. like uh, editors on steroids a little bit, but they can be a good, you know, ID substitute. Same as Vim. Are uh, you? Uh, uh, Convolvet is uh, base Mac. It's a Mac distribution with Go uh, support. Okay. Yeah. So those of you who haven't decided yet, pick pick something. Pick an IDE or an editor that you know and set your Go environment with it. Uh, so you have uh, keyword highlighting, you have the kind of a integrated uh, tool chain with it. So your work is, you kind of become a, a bit more productive. Um, why do we use particular ID or a particular editor? Just to make our life easier. So if you can achieve something by not typing, but by key combination, it will in the long run make it will make your life easier. So uh, pick something that you're comfortable with and it kind of uh, feels less like work when you're using it. So what we will do, I will, um, I will use uh, ID which I'm using. I'm using uh, IntelliJ. And we will kind of code a simple service uh, that you can um, send a request to. So we would like to be able to send some data in and the service will send us data back. So what we want to start with is to have a simple service which will respond to a URL of our choosing and send us some JSON structure back. Okay? So let's uh, pick something trivial. Let's have a data structure which is uh, of the form um, is that big enough? No, it's not big enough. Um, editor. So 
So let's say 16. Okay. So let's have um, a student which is a struct and then we will have something which is a name and h. Okay. So it's a very simple data structure. If we were to encode it um, in JSON, uh, we have choices, um, but we have to have two fields, right? So we have to have a field name and field age. So if I were to follow a usual JSON conventions, I would say I have a field called name, and then here I will have the, the value, comma, and then I will have a field age which will give me a value. And the first one will be a, would be a string. So for example, it would be Marius, or let's say Tom. And then I can have, or I don't need to have that extra uh, comma. So in JSON notation, usually you can avoid the, um, the final trading comma if you don't need it. And here I would have an actual number. So let's say 21. So as you see, there is a small mismatch between my naming convention for my struct in JSON and my naming convention in my type um, in Go, right? So what we do is we discussed that before. So we kind of shown a notation where you tie uh, particular JSON fields to a particular type of the struct that you're using in, in Go by annotating it with a kind of a back tick uh, notation which specifies um, what is the field name, right? So here I would have to say, okay, uh, by the way, um, the um, the JSON property of name is called name with small n. And then the JSON pro property of uh, H is H with small a, right? So to avoid problems with case sensitivity. And this is just a back tick. So now what we have, we have a data structure which represents a data that we want to pass around, and we are able to write, um, we can say there is a student, uh, which is of type student, and it has name Tom, and it's 20 year, 21 years old. As you've seen, my IDE is kind of adding some extra things for me. So when I'm using this construction to create a new student um, instance, the ID says, okay, by the way, the first parameter is name uh, taken from the student and the second parameter is age. It's kind of order dependent, right? So it knows that if I, if I said Tom age, I mean, if I said Tom 21, the first one is name and the second is age, and it kind of annotates those fields names here for me. Uh, so it's a little bit easier, and it highlights uh, S saying, look, you've declared S, but you never use it. Maybe it's a mistake, right? So I have this uh, red flag here saying, you're probably doing something wrong. So linter and the semantic checker is kind of running in the background and having some, some issues, um, highlighting some issues. All right, so once we've done this, um, what can we do? to code the actual, um, so this is the server site. What we need is a client site. So I don't actually have the example here. So let's go back and um, check how would we do um, a hello world. <clears throat> so if I say hello world example 
HTTP Golang, I will get some sort of a um, tutorial and I will check how can I open um, this one is overly complicated actually all I need is I need this I need to use a HTTP module which is inside net HTTP and I need to declare a handler um, which will respond to request for a particular URL hook that I kind of instantiate okay so all I need is I need a function which will be my handler function for a particular URL that I need to do um, and I need to um, uh, bootstrap it by specifying the port on which the server will listen and a HTTP handler. I will come back to it in a moment. So let's first um, do the, the first part, which is the, the actual handling of the request. Okay. So I need some, some function which takes two parameters. Um, it takes a response writer and a request. So every HTTP request comes in a form packaged up in a form of a request, which we referenced here as R. And then the way we respond to that request is packaged up as a response writer. And we can basically write stuff to the response writer, right? So with the kind of normal HTTP request, if I go, let's say, uh, I say www.google.com, I'm making a GET request over HTTP protocol requesting a single slash. Um, it's like, you know, single slash, which is like a root document of that website. So the web server on Google side will receive that GET request asking for a single slash, and it needs to re respond to that request. To respond to that request, it will send a header and it will send the body of the of, as a response, right? Um, so this response writer allows me to <coughs> specify what the header should be like and what the response will be like. Um, I'm not doing everything manually because Go helps me to manage that. So I'm not actually writing the header myself. Go will write it for me. What I can do is I can use the um, I can use the format um, print. So let's say I want to print line, and then I can use W and say hello world. Okay. So what? What the request handler now does, it says, okay, if I got this request, which I am handling, please write in the body of the response, hello world in plain text, and then close the connection. And in, uh, implicitly, when I started writing to that output uh, uh, writer, the header was prepared for me, which specifies the response code 200, which means everything went okay and then the connection will be closed. We will talk a little bit about response codes in a minute. I just want to do a first cycle where I kind of explain what the kind of um, response request and then the server, how they kind of tie together. So this is a, the simplest response you can do that everything was fine and then we're writing a response back. Okay, yeah? So the first F means that I'm writing to the file I'm writing to some sort of buffer right so without that if I just send print line that would mean I'm writing to standard output to the console right but I don't want to write to the console the value of W I want to write into W right so F means I'm uh, writing as, as you've seen um, here the first parameter is IO writer so IO writer is like a pipe to which you can write into, right? So here I have a response writer, which is also an IO writer, which is like a type 
to which you can write. It's like streams in C++, right? Those of you who had streams, have you had streams in C++? Yeah, so it's kind of like the, uh, uh, it's not really object-oriented metaphor, but it's like a metaphor of a pipe to which you can write. And then you have reader from where you can read, right? So, so this F means I'm writing to a writer. And I wrote a simple text, and then the connection will be closed, and the request is served. So how can we fix, uh, so we don't need this student yet. Uh, what we need here is we need those two extra lines, which we have here, which is the HTTP uh, registering my handler uh, to the URL that we want that handler to work with. So I will say <coughs> HTTP um, handle function and my pattern, let's say, is hello. And my handler function is called handler. Because it's a very generic name, let's call it handler hello, okay? Because this handler just prints hello world, okay? So I will say handler hello. And so I've registered that for URLs which say slash hello, this handler should respond. And I now, um, I want to start up a server. So if I, if I um, compile it and run it, so I have to, <coughs> I have to set up that it's a Go application and we're running a file and the file is hello, okay. So now I can, whoops, I didn't save it. So I say it's a, let's go application, this is all good. And we say plus, ah, this is all good. I say apply, okay. Now I have, uh, let's, let's rename it, let's call it, Hello, main. All right, so now if I run it, um, it complains that, let's say we want to run a directory. It run, right? It, it compiles and it runs, but it actually doesn't do anything. It doesn't have a server running, right? So what it did, it kind of registered the function and then it quit, right? What we want is we want the server uh, to continue running, accepting the, um, um, accept the connections from the outside, right? And we, we do it by calling this method, listen and serve. And then we have to pass a parameter, which is, um, okay, let's first do that. So the first parameter is the address on which you're listening, right? Your laptop or your server can have multiple network cards and you might be listening on multiple network interfaces, right? Um, one of the interfaces that, we, uh, that you may know is this one. What's this one? It's a local host, right? If I'm listening on the local host and someone tries to connect to me from outside, will they be able to from uh, internet? No, because a local host is a local host and it, it only serves local traffic. It's not visible from outside your local laptop, right? So what I can say, I can say 127.0.0.1 and then I have to specify the port on which uh, my server will run. What are the typical HTTP ports? What's the default HTTP port? Yeah? 80. 80. Uh, what's the alternative? What's the second most typical H HTTP port? 8080. 8080. Usually, if you're running anything on your, on your laptop, it will bind to port 80. But 8080 is another uh, typical HTTP port, which would also work. What will happen if I say 84? Would it work as well? Yeah, it would work if the port is not occupied, right? You have to put, you have to use the port which is not occupied. Okay, and then the, the second parameter for now, let's use nil. Um, 
I will explain a little bit more about the handler later, but let's forget about the handler for now, okay? Uh, so what will happen is uh, I'm listening on a local host on port 8080 and I'm serving traffic every time I hit that hello uh, URL, okay? So let's say um, I am connected to the internet right now and I have a public IP address which Chris can connect to if he wanted to and I didn't have a firewall, right? So if I have port 8080 opened on my laptop and I change this to this, it would mean he can browse that server that I just created because then I'm listening on all the available interfaces, right? So if I don't specify the host name or the IP address on which I'm listening to, only port, it means I'm listening on all the IP addresses and ports that I, the machine has. Do you understand the difference? So if you want to be safe and if you only want to run it on local host, just say you're running it on local host, okay? If you don't care and if you already blocked everything because you have a firewall uh, running on your machine, then it doesn't matter. You can kind of delete that, right? And then, but then you open on all the interfaces that you um, that you have. Comments? What's the IP to open all interfaces by default? Yeah. Which IP would you use to open all interfaces? So yes. what's the alternative to this? Yes. Which would also work and open for everything? Yeah. No post. No, so localhost only opens the local localhost. So what's the alternative notation to open on all the interfaces? Star. Star sometimes works. Yeah, here I think it would work. What <laughs> what else? Perfect. That's, one. That's the one. So this also opens on all the interfaces, right? Very good. All right, let's uh, stick to global. I don't care. Um, and let's run it. So now if I run it, okay, what happened? In my console, I don't see the program finished. And my Mac says, oh, one of your programs wants to open port 8080. Are, are you happy with it? <laughs> Do you want to expose port 8080 to the outside traffic? I say, yeah, sure, why not? Okay, so now if I go, um, if I go to localhost, I don't actually know what was my uh, what um, public address I got. Um, right, I could look it up and use a public address, and it would work as well. But if I use localhost, it will work as well. What will happen if I present it right now? Yeah. Okay, who says, who agrees with him? Who agrees with him, hand, hand up? Who disagrees with him, hands up? Come on, you can either agree or disagree. All right, what will happen if I say hello? All right. <laughs> so, what will happen now? Hello world. Okay. Well... <laughs> Page not found happened. Why? Let's try this. Let's try adding the extra tick, <laughs> xlab uh, slash. Let's rerun it. And let's reload this. Now it worked, okay? So what happened was my browser automatically added the trailing slash, which the server interpreted as, no, you're not handling hello slash, you're just handling hello, right? Okay, so can I, okay, let's, let's repeat that. Let's start it without the trailing slash. Um, and let's try, let's try that again. And annoyingly, my browser keeps adding that trailing slash, right? If I was able to ask for that, 
it would work. How can I check that, that it would work? Well, I have to somehow make a request without the trailing slash and the browser is not the perfect thing. So what I can use is there is a extension app in Chrome. Uh, if you um, say Chrome Postman, you will get kind of to Chrome Web Store. There are other solutions. I'm using Postman. You can use something else, right? It's an app which allows you to issue HTTP requests to anything you want. And you can define what the header should be, what the URL should be, and what the body should be. It's kind of a handy tool for poking and asking queries for different websites which sometimes require post, right? For example, in the in the browser, I can't really do a post request. I have to do a get request, right? Um, so you can't easily test if your post handlers work correctly. Um, so what you can do is you can install it. And once you install it, you can launch it. And if you launch it, it will look like this. And what I can do is I can say, OK, uh, copy that URL for me. Copy that. I will paste it here. And it's a get request. And I just want to see what uh, what the response is. So I will send it. And here it goes. It says, hello world. My response is, hello world, right? Yeah. You still did that. I can. So we know that the code works without the trailing slash. What will happen if I say, with the trailing slash? Well, I can test it. Page not found and the error, status error 404. OK? It is sometimes a little bit annoying. If you ever configured your web server, if you had some uh, Nginx or Apache configuration going, and sometimes you have those leading trailing uh, slashes, sometimes don't, and some rules will work, some will not, you know, you have to be quite careful. OK? So it's up to you to define whether you want that trailing slash or not, right? If I force it to have a trailing slash, then what will happen is if I stop it and if I rerun it again, allow it, and then I will request without the trailing slash, I will have um, 200 OK. Why, why, why it works now? So I, I couldn't test it with the um, I couldn't test it with my browser because my browser always adds that trailing slash no matter what, right? Uh, but what why does it work without the trailing slash if I if I specify the rule? Well, it works because beneath the scene, the Go server, if I ask for something without the trailing slash, it will also check if I have a handler with the trailing slash uh, available. And it, it will kind of seamlessly work for both, right? So a kind of a good rule of thumb is if you're specifying the patterns for your uh, routes in your Go server, end them with a trailing slash just to be kind of safe, OK? All right, what will happen if I don't have hello? Well, now you know. What, you know what to expect. You expect 404 not found, right? So how does that happen? Well, there is a little bit of magic happening behind the scenes. So when I, when I started this line, I actually I am using a default handler because I said I, I don't have a handler, so handle everything for me. Uh, and every time something hits the pattern, pass it to that handler here, right? So every time I am requesting anything which doesn't fit that pattern, this server will respond with 404 automatically, right? So if you want to know details, uh, you, can, um, you can go to the, if I go to Golang, sorry, Golang docs, and if I say listen and serve on the, on the HTTP package. So now I'm in the help in the documentation for net HTTP. And then uh, one of the calls that we are using is listen and surf. 
The first one is the address, the second one is a handler. I can look inside and I can check what is this magic handler here. Well, the handler is something that serves HTTP, right? So it is the, the module which accepts the connections and actually handles them and writes the response. You know, it reminds you to what we're doing here, right? So the default handler, what it does, it delegates everything which comes and hits the pattern to your uh, function. And then everything which doesn't hit the pattern, there is a 404. If I had uh, another function, so I have um, another handler um, which says, um, I don't know, something different. So I can um, copy that. And it says F word, right? Um, and then I register it. with the root. Um, this one will say F world and this one will say hello world, right? Let's try it. What's that? Oh yeah, yeah. This one is not the correct one. Yep. So now if we run that, we allow <coughs> We go here and we test our default one. It says F. And then if we say hello, it says hello world, right? There is also a little bit of magic because in fact, if I didn't have uh, this one, let's try that. I only have the main one now. I only listen to the root, right? So now if I say root, you expect the F word, but what do you expect if I say hello? Do you expect not found? The main handler handles that as well, right? So if I, um, if I register that handler, that handler is the generic one, which handles anything which starts with slash and then the rest is up to the handler to handle, right? So if I have both enabled, I have a pattern which says hello and a pattern which says um, slash. And then you can see that this one is actually a specific case of this one, right? So Google know, uh, uh, I mean the runtime knows that this one is a specific part and it should be handled by hello and this one should be handled by F. Yeah? Is it uh, the standard convention to name all handlers with handler first? No, you, it's up to you. So there is no really any generic convention for naming your handlers. It's up to your team to decide what's the convention. Um, so Let's say I enable the more specific one. I will rerun it. Allow. So now the interesting thing is that what I can say is I can add some stuff here, right? I can say Tom. And the hello world will work because it fits the pattern and then the rest is extra which is passed to the request. In fact, you can, you can see it by printing it out. So you can say, I want to um, print hello world uh, called with, and I say string, and I say uh, request URL uh, path. Okay, so you can see the whole path which I, I called it with. I need to say print f. And it's nice if I say there is an end of line. So if I stop this, and if I rerun it, I allow it, and then I go to this. So now we're calling it hello Tom, right? So if I run it again, it says, yeah, the usual, and then it says you are called with hello Tom, right? So now 
let's say we want to say hello Tom, right? So we want to be able to say who hello should be to. So what do we need to do? Well, we need a name, okay? So we need a name and then the name will be a string and we know that the request uh, URL path has slash hello slash name. Um, so there is a, let's say we have parts of the URL and we can use strings to split the URL path based on the slash, which is the separator, right? So I can partition the string, which is for me, hello Tom, by slashes and get the second one, which should be Tom, right? So <laughs> if I say name is the parts, which is the second one of the parts, right? It would work. However, if I didn't call it with the name, then this will throw an exception. So let's, let's pause it, let's rerun it. We allow it, we call it with Tom. Well, the, the first one is actually empty, right? Because it actually has three. Uh, so it, there is a slash name, I mean, hello slash name. And the first slash has an empty string before it, right? So in fact, I need to say it's number two, okay? So let's say hello Tom with, okay, let's rerun it. Allow, it's running, we calling hello Tom. And here it says hello Tom. If I said, said Tom with capital T, It would say, um, come on, yeah, because it, it cached my request, so, all right, it works. But if I call it with uh, something, if I say slash Novostavsky, it still works because the slash ends my second part, right? So I can build more complex URLs, schemas, and kind of um, adjust what I want to get. Um, but if I said something like Q blah, 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 then it's, yeah, that probably, um, yeah, that is parse. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's correct. So what happened here is, uh, when you're doing get requests, you can pass parameters after the question mark and those parameters are parsed before I get the path. In the path, I'm not getting anything up out uh, from that onwards. So my string, my what I'm splitting into parts, this URL path doesn't have any parameters. They are handled separately, and then I can recover them. Um, so anyway, so let's forget about this. What will happen if I call it like this? Well, it kind of says hello empty, um, and kind of returns an empty string after the second. Um, yeah, it's a little bit unexpected, right? You would expect the parts don't have. So let's do a small test and let's say format. I want to see if print, I want to see, let's say print line w what parts is okay so we stop it we rerun it print, print. <clears throat> so let's say let's call it with ma so it's empty hello ma and then let's call it without anything. It's empty, hello, empty, <laughs> right? So it gives me that empty string at the end, right? 
So that's why it doesn't throw an exception because I actually have zero, one, two. I have index two, which is the empty string, right? But if I ask for, like if I were to write uh, Mariusz Nowostawski, then and I would separate it into parts and say I want name uh, space surname and I said parts number three right if we do this really run it I rerun it and it says hello Mariusz Novo but then if I delete those two then we'll have an exception, right? Because the, the name will be empty string, but surname is like non-existent. So if I press now, whoa, something crashed, right? Our server crashed. And here we, we have the exception trace, right? Um, index out of range, number three, right? So we have to kind of write code which prevents this type of behavior. So we, at some point, we have to check, like if we want our API to say name surname, we have to say if parts, um, actually you, you do this, then parts is different than what you expect. Like if we want an API to handle name surname, what, how many we expect? We expect four, right? If it's different than four, then we're not dealing with it anymore. We have to send something um, back to the server. Okay, so that might be a good point for Chris to talk about error codes. What you know? What should we do? Right. So we have to somehow send um, a status code. Um, actually, we have to say HTTP. Uh, status. There is a number of different or we can say error. And then we say W wrong number of parameters. And then that's what we need to write. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so we need a, a, an error code. Yeah. So you guys, um, you didn't have any web um, calls yet, as you must. No, not really, right? So um, we briefly talked about um, error codes or status codes in HTTP. So which ones do we know already? 404. 404, what does that mean? Not found. Not found, cool. That's kind of everyone knows that one, right? So the default one, yeah. 200 okay. 200 okay. Anything else? 300 redirect or something. 300 redirect or something. Okay, let's just collect some of them. <laughs> 300 redirect or something. Well, I'm not writing that part out. So we figured out 404. I put, put this here. 404. And there's 200 over here. Cool. So everything is okay. 300. Um, any, any other code? Mm. Nope, yeah. 400. Cool. So, right. 500. Okay. Uh, any other code you know? Yeah. 201. 201. Okay. What does that stand for? It's created. Uh, okay. Something has been created. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's put it through. 418. 418. Yes. Okay. Elaborate. <laughs> I know what's coming now. Well, um, IT people. Alerts in general like that, right? So, error code 418 is the requested service cannot end properly because it is a default. It actually got deprecated on the last four words. I wrote the change one. Yeah. Yes, so that's a default one. Um, default protocol specification. Um, so, but we see a pattern here if you look at it, right? So. Who spots it, right? <coughs> no? Yes? Uh, uh, I was sense. just recommending everybody bookmark HTTP statuses for 
Oh, there's so you can use Wikipedia, HTTP status.com. That's it's like everywhere if you um, bring up HTTP status. The key I want to get across here is that you guys all know the patterns. And uh, which pattern do we see? That the spoiler is there. Ah, you're not helping me. <laughs> okay. So there you go. Well, so what? Which pattern do we see then? If anyone can read it. Well, 200 is success, you mentioned, with various variants. So like the create 201, for example, is if it's about creating a resource on a server side, would be a possible response. 300, then uh, redirection aspects, usually, right? So redirection, do you know any variants of redirection code? Yeah, no, in practice. No, OK. So usually people use uh, 302 quite commonly for redirection of their own web pages. But this is generally not recommended to use anyway. So it's, a lot, it's uh, kind of a characteristic um, misuse, I guess, standard misuse of redirection of your home page because it's only uh, for, um, it indicates that the actual um, resource at that location hasn't been found. But this is um, one of the more <coughs> so misused one. If you have a temporary or permanent redirect of your home page, you yeah. should differentiate this into 301 yeah. 303. Yeah. But people hardly do that. So, uh, But anyway, so there's common misuse, like such as the teapot one is another good example of that one. So those are the constants in Go. So the teapot is there as well. And here you, you see exactly what Maya said well just now. The constant in Go co correspond to the actual codes, right? So you obviously need to look that up for your programming language of choice, or perhaps you can directly encode it uh, numerically, which is sometimes uh, easier, but not really uh, legible, so not, not self-descriptive. Um, but so in the 300 range, we usually don't deal with much. That's more like if you configure and set up your web service or your DNS um, redirection, that's something you, you're dealing with there. 200 we discussed, 404 is generally client-side issues. So it's like uh, you request that URL doesn't exist. Another popular one is, Four, three, yes, no, perhaps. Did anyone come across that before? No? Yeah, I have. Yeah, quite commonly, if you access a resource, you're not signed up, right? So you have the wrong authorization. Or if your key <laughs> timed out. Or, yeah, key yeah. times out. It's uh, just if you are, um, have uh, some sort of session timeout. Yes. So that usually means that something is wrong on the client side. You're generally, your URL is wrong, standard case. Uh, what was 4 1 again? Uh, not, um, unauthorized. Unauthorized, uh, basically. So there is yes, unauthorized. That's so so the <laughs> difference between 403 and 401 is that 403 you are authorized but you are not f allowed to access that resource whereas if you are not logged in technically you should get 401 if the service doesn't know who you are. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Which package is the host is defining? In in HTTP status. You see the the, the um, presentation is quite explicit in here. HTTP status. <coughs> um, so that's the client side issue, right? And then the server side, the classical 500, I think everyone helped you had that, right? In particular, if you, uh, yeah, well, if you um, uh, access some sort of uh, website where the you know, back, back end uh, web service is down or something like that, so quite typically on PHP uh, websites, the classic arrow you see. Uh, but again, there's various ones for you can differentiate for, but generally people just type 500 because it's really, really dependent uh, on your implementation. So it's usually quite generic error that is not passed to the you know gateway machine, but because it's in the end, it's, it boils down to um, the actual um, you know programming language and so on. Quite often you see the perhaps the you, um, your stack trace or error log or whatever else coming along with this as a body, but uh, generally 500 means something went wrong on the server side. Now our question is, which one is the guide status we need to pick for our problem? Again, yeah. remember those classes, so 200, 300, 400, 500, and figure out when to use which, right? So you can't just use them arbitrarily. The idea is that you actually should stick to the standard to, to actually apply them. So in our case, which error code is most likely a good one here? Yes, um, yep. 501. Uh, okay. Not implemented. Ah, okay. So there is a proposal to use 501. Okay. Um, we could do that. We could say. Other thoughts, ideas? 
All right, so if we did that um, and we rerun it, right? If I now ask localhost for, so, so if I say uh, Tom Yates, hello Tom Yates, if I say um, hello, um, well, I should say return. So it crashed because I continue, yeah. So let's do it again. So if I reload. Now it works correctly, right? It does what you intended to do, but is that semantically correct? Was the malformed URL some, like, are we planning to implement something which acts on hello? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, right? So if our intention was to handle greetings and our specification says, you know, the, the specification says it has to be in this format and someone asks us not following the format, it's not the server-side problem, it's rather client-side issue that the client doesn't follow the spec, right? So what other error could we do here instead, yeah? 400 bad requests, potentially, right? So let's try that. If I redo this. Hello. We don't have name, surname. We run it. It says bad request, right? It points out that Okay, the ser there is nothing wrong with the server. The server operates as expected. It's just that the request is not well formatted, right? So it depends. It depends on the intentions and it depends on what you're trying to do. If indeed you were implementing something that reacts to hello, but it was currently not implemented, then 501 is probably a good choice. But if you already implemented the full functionality that you want and someone mis misformatted the request, then it's bad request, right? Um, so you see that it's uh, one or you have to make a decision. Is it a server problem or is it a client problem? And then if it is a server problem, pick something from 500 range. If it's the client problem, pick something from the 400 range. All right. So let's have a short break. Um, and let's meet 20 past one. There is uh, one small comment. Uh, I wasn't clear enough um, about this IDE extension. So if you see this line here, I'm instantiating student and I'm saying it has a name Tom and age 21, but those great things here are added by my IDE. They are not part of the source code. They just, they're visually inside the editor to help me with the, you know, work like this thing. Right, so this is artificial thing which the IDE adds. It's not part of the source code. To to prove it, I can comment that line out, and you see those extra things are gone. They are not part of the code. They just added there by the IDE. So if I uncomment it, the IDE magically adds those things because it says, "Oh yeah, you mean Tom, the name, and 21 as an H," because it knows it from the declaration of the student type. Right? It's the same for those function calls. It knows that the handle func takes two arguments and the first one is the pattern and the second one is the handler, right? The handle function. It didn't prefix it with the handler because I already called the function handler, so maybe that's why it didn't prefix it, but the nil one it did, right? So don't pay attention to those gray things. They are not part of the source code. So if you look at the actual source code, which I have here in the in Vim, none of that is here. None of those uh, gray things is actually in the source code. It's just visually for the editor. All right, so we have a working server. 
it serves this hello greetings, which is great, but we didn't want hello greetings. What we want is we want to be able to serve a student, right? So let's say we have some sort of student, um, which we have here. His name is Tom. Um, we take that out. And we have the hello handler, and then we say we are handling students. Um, and the student will be handled by the root. And we have this one here, which we say is a student. Uh, and we're not printing hello anymore. We want to write back um, a JSON structure, which will be um, our student. So let's say I have um, uh, let's do it properly. So let's have um, um, yeah, normally you wouldn't have a global variable, okay? Normally you would either use database or you'd handle some the, the storage of the student some, somehow nicely, but um, Let's make it that we have uh, students, which is an array of um, um, students um, a slice over student type. How should we how should we do it? Okay, let's say an idea what to use as a temporal storage layer. Let's say we have two students um, just for simplicity. Okay, so the handler will, will have two students um, with the IDs of zero and one and then if we have a student which is not id zero or one then we don't deal with it we say yeah that we don't have that student okay so the student uh zero will will be tom and then student one will be mark So now what we want is um, we want to parse the URL for which we're getting the students. And let's kind of make student like this so we can handle the um, additional parameter. So what we would like to have, hello works as we design it. So it takes a name and a surname, right? And then with students, we want uh, it to work if we say I want the student zero or if I get the student one and that's it we currently don't have any other functionality right I mean in theory that should be the ID right uh, but we kind of ma making it very primitive for for time being if I get just a call on student I want all students to come back right so I want both students I mean currently we only have two so I want the, a, a list of students to be uh, written back. So we can kind of look a little bit here. So here we have um, a kind of a code snippet which says I have articles like we have students and there is a, an array of articles which we um, create kind of manually ourselves. So we can do the same thing here. We can say okay there is an array of students so we can say students is um, student and we have s0 and s0 and s1. So we have 
Um, what do you want? Okay. Um, and then what we can do is we can <laughs> encode the, those students as uh, JSON, right? We can automatically encode uh, using JSON. Um, not JSON encoder. Let's pick here. We say new encoder and we pass the stream and then we dump into the stream an encoded objects that we get from the variable which we pass to the encode method, right? So we say uh, new encoder and we have to pass w to it and then we say encode and we have to pass what data structure we are encoding. So in our case we are encoding students, right? But this is the case where we have to return all the students, right? We have to distinguish between when we are asked for a particular student or when we are asked for multiple students. We do that by doing the same thing as we did before, right? So what we want is we want um, the parts and then before we do anything, let's just test it. Um, so we don't do anything yet. We just say, okay, um, format f print line uh, parts. So we can of see what we're getting if we're making those uh, queries to student API, right? So here, if I make a uh, cannot use parts. Yes, I cannot use parse because I have to write to W. Uh, we are importing JSON, but we're not using it. It's an error, so we have to comment that out. Okay, now it works. So we test it. We test it with, um, without the trading. We get the trading. So we see we have zero of argument is empty. Then we have student. And then we have an empty string. If we say zero and we do this, we get empty student and zero, right? So we have three or two parameters, right? So what we would do is we say, okay, if we get, um, so if, whoops, we don't need brackets. If we get uh, parts, which is three, that means we are asking for a particular student. Else, if we got len parts, which is two, then we, um, Yeah, the third one is empty, right? So we will get three or four. Let's double check that. So if I asked for, I'm getting a, okay, let's see. Now I'm getting the empty. If I don't do the trailing slash, I'm not getting the empty one. So in fact, we can't distinguish by size only because in both cases I'm getting three items, right? Um, so, well, not ideal. So if it's three, then our URL is okay, but we still cannot tell if we're asking for all students or just one. So we actually have to get and check if uh, parts two is nil, Oops, sorry. Then we asking for all students. Else, else we asking for uh, in, yeah, concrete student. Okay. So if we asking for all students, 
then we will be doing something like this and and then else if we're asking for a concrete student we have to we have to get um, so if no brackets if parts of one equals zero we do we return what will we, will we return what should be here Parts two. Mismatch. We're doing it by strings which is untidy, normally you should convert the string to integer and kind of do a lookup, but maybe your keys are hashes or maybe your kind of primary keys of the students here are strings. Like if I, 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 if I have kind of a, some sort of a number, which is an integer, then I would parse it to integer, but if it's a, you know, if it's a hash, then I can treat it as a string, right? In any case, that's an ID of the student. We kind of treating them as uh, as strings. So zero and one are the IDs that we kind of have currently in the system. So what should come here? Who knows? Okay. So this if kind of statement is a little bit complicated, right? Um, the first part is we check if it is three <coughs> items that we have. Because we've discovered that if we have student and ask for it, we have one, two, three items. If we put a student with the ID, I will have one, two, three items, but the third item is not nil, right? Uh, not empty string. So this is just an error check if the call to our API is correct. We can simplify it by saying, okay, if it's not three, we have to handle error, right? And then return. So we don't get into trouble. Make sense? So now if I, um, if I have this, so our error condition is handled error handling and then we kind of handle the case the student case and the student cases we have to respond with everybody so we package up everybody as an array and then send everybody back right as an array else we not asking for anybody every everybody we asking handle student with the ID. And then the parts two gives us that ID. It's either zero or one. So if it is zero, our zero student is a zero. So it's Tom. So we say as zero. And then our one case, one ID is as one. Um, so we say as one. Does it make sense? <laughs> All right, so let's try it. <coughs> let's rerun it. Um, 
Okay, we have a problem. We are having extra parentheses, which we cannot have. Um, okay, we cannot compare strings to nil. So it is actually not nil, it's an empty string, right? Um, okay, we compile it, it runs. Okay, so now if we go here and we say student zero, what should we get? We should get Tom. Look, we got name Tom, age 21. We got Tom Beck, right? It's a JSON structure with braces and we got it back, right? So our student named Tom, age 21, got marshaled into the JSON and we got it back. What if we get number one? We get Mark, right? It works. If we say nothing, we get an array of both Tom and Mark. Does it make sense? So, yeah? Is it the same if you use the json.marshall function? So here we... Um, so json.marshall generates... Uh, the marshaled representation of the object and then you have to pass it to the pipe. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of easier to use the encoder because then I can do it in one line. But it would work the same way if you used Marshall and then the output of the Marshall you feed by fprint of something into the pipe. It would work the same way, yes. So it, it will then be in pipe code? Yeah. So you have to pass it over to a at the end of the day, you have to push um, JSON into the pipe. So you, it has to, you have to convert it to the kind of um, uh, string representation that you can feed into the writer, yeah. right? Okay, there is one small missing piece, okay? The missing, missing piece is, uh, yeah, there are many missing pieces, like if I say two, for example, right? It sends me nothing back and there is no exception, right? In fact, it sent me nothing back with okay. But what should happen is it should say, well, you know, not found or something like that. This student number two doesn't exist, right? So like not found would probably a correct response to this request, right? Uh, but instead I got okay. So error handling is not yet fully done. You would have to redo it. But there is more serious problem. So the more serious problem is that if we look here, if we use this for our student request and I say I want to get Tom and I send this, I got Tom back and I got status okay. But if I look into headers, I got the body, I got this as if it's text plain, right? So my content type is plain text. Well, if we Google, um, if we say JSON content type header, right? If we sending JSON back, uh, well, we can go to Stack Overflow and it says, I've been, uh, what is the correct header, um, right? For JSON, according to the spec, is application JavaScript. Um, there is an article why you shouldn't use text HTML for JSON. Um, Internet Explorer doesn't handle application JSON. It's a mess, right? Uh, Lots of people use, um, they would use um, yeah, most people use this. So it would be nice if we can modify our content type to have application JSON instead of plain text, 
right? So in um, in our header, currently we're returning text plain, but we need to change that. So if I go to the before we start writing back JSON, we know that this handler will be responding with um, and then the header was a function. Yep. All right, let's test it. It seems to work so far. It builds correctly. If we get, uh, if we send this now, yeah. it worked. We got the correct application type. We got application JSON, and the body contains our JSON. As you see now, it's not text anymore. It is actually a JavaScript object in the in the browser here, right? If I do the same here, um, yeah. In any case, what we've done successfully, we're running a server now, which serves JSON as an output. So if we were to make a request, um, we will get a JSON back, and then we can parse it, right? So the second part of the class, but we're running out of time today, would be to write a client, which will talk to our server, ask for a student, and get the JSON back, parse the JSON into a student object, and then do something with it, right? So we have one part of the, uh, of the story already sorted. We've, we've written um, a handler which accepts um, get requests and serves JSON out. And now what we will do, we'll write a client which makes a request to our service and get a particular student back and then par uh, unmarshaled it to um, decode it back to a Go struct and then recreate the S, you know, the, the student instance on the client side. Does it make sense? But because we, um, at the end of the class, we will start with that tomorrow. So those of you who want to do it, you can do it at home. Uh, and then we kind of quickly do the client side tomorrow to talk to our service, get the JSON, and then um, display the, the, the parameters of the, of the JSON struct on the client side. What we will also do tomorrow is we will talk a little bit about the difference between get, post, delete, and other uh, methods which HTTP protocol specifies, and we will change the client code to be able to post something to our service and our service to remember what has been posted. So we will change so that the client can create a new student and then our service will accept the post request and remember that new student internally. So then when you get this particular student back uh, with the particular ID, you will get the new student back. All right, so that's the plan for tomorrow. All right, thank you.